one of your views is that the emphasis on stock performance really hasn't worked very well. And so in addition to being a myth that it's a fiduciary responsibility, it's a myth that it actually works. Um, you've Absolutely. got some statistics yeah, from I, your new book. Yep. Um, I think it's always valuable to pay attention to facts. So let me give you some facts. Um, and these are things we know. Okay, we all know the unemployment rate is up, right? And we all know that inequality is rising. But here are some things that you may not know. Um, between 1997 and 2008, the number of companies listed on U.S. exchanges declined from 8,823 to only 4,501. So the population of public companies has declined 40% in a 10-year period. If this were a species, we'd call it endangered. According to Steve Denning at Forbes, the life expectancy of a typical public corporation has declined from 75 years in the 1940s to 15 years today. There is some evidence that our corporations are less innovative. They account for a smaller percentage of the patents that are filed worldwide than they used to. We all know that executive pay has risen dramatically. Um, but we also know that simultaneously, shareholder returns have declined. The last year has been, you know, the last decade, actually it's now the last 15 years, have been described as the, la the lost decade for investors. And this actually starts somewhat earlier. Um, Roger Martin at the Rotman School in Canada um, has calculated that between 1933 and 1976, shareholders who invested in the S&P 500 enjoyed real compound average annual returns of 7.5%. After 1976, this average has dropped to 6.5%. So Lynn, what has happened? I mean, in other words, everybody talks about paper performance, and, um, and nobody really talks about pay for values or, or pay for um, purpose, or um, what has actually been happening? Well, well, I'm going to actually say, you know, I'm a hard-headed economics type. I actually have a case book in law and economics. I don't worry about values. I'll leave that to you guys. Um, you business people, I'm, me as a professor, I'm going to be hard-headed. Um, but what's happened is that we're learning is that pursuing shareholder value is bad for shareholders as well as pretty much everyone else with the exception of some hedge funds and some executives. And I trace this series of problems, this suite of problems that are reflected in these statistics, they have a lot of causes, but one of the causes, I think, is ideology. And the widespread acceptance of this very simple, I will actually say simplistic idea, that corporations are run well when they're run to maximize shareholder value, which is almost always ultimately measured by share price. And that makes a fatal mistake. It, it, it teaches business people many of whom, and we have two on the stage here, have resisted the notion because they know better, but it tells business people that they're supposed to run their companies according to the metric of a hypothetical entity, a non-existent entity, this hypothetical shareholder that only cares about what happens to the share price of one company tomorrow. And that hypothetical, that hypothetical entity is a functional psychopath. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> short-sighted, opportunistic and willing to exploit employees, self-destructive, pursuing shareholder value at one firm, even though it harms their other interests, their interests in their jobs and their environment and their returns from their other investments, and psychopathically unconcerned about the welfare of other people, the future generations, or the planet. I, I have never met any CEO who's even close to that Amen. explanation. Right. Yeah. I, know. I, I, I don't know what, what statistics you're reading, but... Those are not the people running American companies. No, today. don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying those are the people who run American companies. I know a lot of business people. I actually think they score pretty well compared to, say, oh, I don't know, professors on ethics and values. The problem is that the business people are under pressure to run their corporations according to this psychopathic ideal. I'm not saying that's your goal. I'm saying you're constantly subject to pressures to do it, even though, ironically enough, in the, at the end of the day, these structural pressures, it's not evil people, it's not evil shareholders, it's not evil executives. It's a system that is now structurally designed to produce results that are bad for almost all of us. 
Howard, you look like you're disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard, how are you? How, how are you? Yeah. How are you paid? Uh, <laughs> I have a salary like you, Joe, and oh. and we and we get a bonus that is tied to EPS and return on mm -hmm. on, on equity. Mm -hmm. uh, and Starbucks has obviously, you know, over the last 12 months or so, had a record year, record revenue, record profit, rec record stock price. Mm -hmm. But I think just going back to what you said and, and really the topic of this conversation is at the end of the day, uh, it's really about what you are measuring and rewarding inside your organization. I, I can't remember a conversation, honestly, in any Starbucks meeting where I've heard somebody say, this is going to be good for the stock price. I've never heard it. The, 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 the only issue that we're talking about at the center of every room is our customers and our people and trying to do everything we can to exceed expectations. And the lens in which we, we manage and build the company is trying to do the right thing for them. And I think the litmus test for us all the time is, is this decision going to make our people proud because if it isn't, they're not going to support it and execute it. And is this going to be good for the customer? And I think when you're, when you're managing a business with, with that kind of framework, it's very easy to do the right thing. Now, we all have pressures. I understand exactly what you said. But uh, you know, you're the leader of a company. And we're leaders. And we're paid to be leaders. And we're paid to be moral people. We're not paid to justify the whims and the short-term mentality and the pressure of Wall Street, which is no longer quarter to quarter, it's five minutes. But we're not going to play their game. The game we're going to play is we're going to build a great, sustainable, enduring company by trying to do the right thing. And as I said yesterday, and we are going to make mistakes, and we're not perfect, but we are going to perform over the long term. And I think you know, getting back to all of this is Starbucks employs 200,000 people. We're in the people business. We can't create value for the shareholder if you don't create value for your people. It's, it's a pr pretty simple formula. And let me push you just a little bit on yeah. that. I, I think you know how much I admire what you've done, and, and this sounds great. But as you put it, you're in the people business. Um, you sell a premium product. You sell a product that you can get a price premium for, in part because of the image. If you were manufacturing ball bearings, and having to sell them B2B, business to business, to somebody else. If it wasn't so important that the people in front of the customer had the enthusiasm, but just that they made the ball bearings at a cheap price that's competitive in a commodity, commoditized market, wouldn't it be different? You know, I think every industry has its own challenges, but I think if you look at many of the industries who are, who are in a commodity-type business, those businesses that win are the businesses that are doing the right thing. I mean, I, I understand your question. It would be harder, uh, but I'm not in that business. I can't really answer that question.